It's lovely to meet you. Who are you? I'm Steve Ferber. Um, I'm ICL Professor of Computer Engineering in the School of Computer Science at the University of Manchester in the UK. Um, I uh, was brought up in Manchester or in North Cheshire, South Manchester. Um, I went to school at Manchester Grammar School and then I spent 10 years at Cambridge uh, going to uh, initially study mathematics and then a PhD in aerodynamics and I got drawn into the computer industry via a little startup company in Cambridge called Acorn. And in my 10 years at Acorn, which was pretty much the whole of the 1980s, uh, I was involved in some very exciting early developments in personal computing. Uh, so uh, I had a, a hand in the BBC micro development, um, which introduced computing into schools. And following that, we developed the, the first Acorn Risk Machine or ARM processor, which has since come to dominate the mobile and embedded world. After 10 years of Acorn, I moved to Manchester and uh, my title, Computer Engineering, suggests that my position is related to the hardware side of computers. So uh, my core research interest is in microchip design. And for the last 20 years, this has been focused on uh, building large scale computing machinery for uh, real-time modeling of biological brains to try and understand the grand scientific challenge of uh, getting to the bottom of how the brain processes information. And uh, to what end? Why do you want to understand how the brain processes Im information? Well, because it's, it's one of the great frontiers of science and, and, and you know, when, when people talk about scientific frontiers, they usually thinking about the unimaginably small, such as subatomic particles, um, or the unimaginably large, such as the square kilometre array, which is you know, looking into the origins of the universe and the far reaches of space. Uh, but we all carry this thing that's a very human size around inside our heads. If we took it out, we could hold it in our hands. Um, and we don't know how it works. And, and, and this seems to me to be a, a big gap in our knowledge and, and a gap that's probably uh, very important um, to our future because we know that, uh, for example, diseases of the brain um, cost the developed economies more than cancer, heart disease and diabetes put together. So um, medically it's extremely important and, uh, and we lack treatments because we don't understand it. So we don't know how to design drugs to interrupt the disease pathways. Um, also, of course, it impinges on, on my professional area of, of computing and computing is increasingly moving towards artificial intelligence. I personally don't think we're anywhere near there yet. Um, what people call AI, I would prefer to badge as machine learning, uh, but understanding more about the brain will certainly help us uh, work out how to make computers a bit more intelligent. Can you talk to us about the specifics of Spinnaker? So the Spinnaker computer is, is a, a, a supercomputer in one sense uh, that's been developed for brain modelling. We started the project about 20 years ago and we considered what we might be able to contribute um, to the, the scientific quest to understand the brain as computer engineers. And, and, we wondered what we could do if we built a machine with about a million mobile phone processors in it and got them all working together so that we could support large scale brain models. Um, we realized uh, very early on that even with a million processors, we're not approaching even 1% of the scale of the human brain. Um, but we are at a scale where we could possibly model uh, you know, whole mouse brains, um, which, which would uh, be a significant step forward. We, we built the machine around a number of principles, but we had to um, customize its, its architecture to the problem of brain modeling because conventional computers really struggle to support large scale brain modeling in anything like real time because the brain is hugely connected. Um, each neuron inside your head, and you have about 100 million of them, connects to uh, on average about 10,000 others. And this requires the communications inside the machine to send messages not from one place to one other place, which is typically what's required in computers, um, but from one place to many thousands of other places. So, so we built a, a bespoke communication infrastructure. 
inside the machine to tune it to this problem. Could you talk about the specifics uh, in relation to the actual silicon chip, um, how the different components work, and the thing that is special about your chip in terms of the connectedness? Each Spinnaker chip um, is about a square centimetre of silicon. That's a, not an atypical size for, for today's chips. Um, it's made on a fairly old silicon process technology and, and uh, so we can manufacture about a hundred million transistors on that chip and, and, and those are divided into 18 processing regions. Each processing region has um, a, a relatively small and energy efficient ARM core, that's the uh, processor I helped develop back at Acorn in the 1980s. Of course it's evolved through the hands of many thousands of people in the meantime. Um, but we use uh, ARM cores with memory and, and, and various peripheral devices. And you can, you can see 18 physical copies of that uh, on the chip if you, if you know what you're looking at. And in the center of the chip, um, there is the thing that implements this connectivity. Um, that is the router? It, yes, it's the, it's the router in the middle of the chip. Biological neurons communicate principally by sending spikes. They go ping every so often. So one of the things to ponder is that all your thoughts um, are spatiotemporal patterns of pings flowing between the neurons in your head. Um, and a ping is, is, is in effect a pure asynchronous event. So there's no information in its size or shape. The information is purely in its timing. So in Spinnaker, each ping becomes a tiny packet um, of information and all that packet of information says is that neuron number 327 just went ping and we communicate that packet around the machine from chip to chip uh, across a machine which occupies 10 data center size rack cabinets and we deliver it in a small fraction of a millisecond to every destination to which it has to go and that's the, the real time requirement. So uh, the, the, the key to Spinnaker is this router in the middle of each chip. Uh, packet switch routing is, is, is not new. It, it's the basis of the internet. You know, all the information that flows when you watch a video on, the um, on your computer that's coming up from an internet source is flowing in packets across the internet. But typically the requirements there are to get very high data rates using very big packets. And the requirement in Spinnaker is to achieve relatively modest data rates, but using tiny packets, because each packet is basically carrying one ping. Um, so, so there's a difference in, in, in the objective um, that is implemented as a difference in, in, in detail. So this little four square millimeters in the middle of each Spinnaker chip is the equivalent of, of, of one of these rack ethernet switches that you see in the corner of many offices today. Um, but obviously we've had to scale everything down and make it very simple and, and lightweight so that we can go from a rack cabinet into uh, a few square millimeters of silicon. And, and, and that's the key to Spinnaker really. So you're now working, having, having reached the landmark moment of uh, a million processors, um, you're now working on uh, Spinnaker 2. Can you take us through what that will entail in terms of um, um, improving on Spinnaker 1. Sure, I mean, I should say, of course, we haven't abandoned Spinnaker 1 because we're still doing a lot of work in, in using it. And we have a whole uh, raft of collaborators through the European Union Human Brain Project, neuroscientists, computational neuroscientists who are, who are keen to map their models onto Spinnaker 1. So a lot of what we're doing is, 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 is supporting users on Spinnaker 1 and working with, with users. Uh, but alongside that, um, Spinnaker 1 is relatively old technology. Um, we've had the silicon since 2011. Um, so we're developing a second generation chip uh, on a much more up-to-date uh, semiconductor technology. Um, and we're developing this in collaboration with, with uh, chip designers at TU Dresden in Germany. Um, and, and, and the goal is, 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 is to hit uh, something around 10x performance per, per chip. And that will allow us to put something perhaps of the scale of a small insect brain into a single Spinnaker 2 chip, which could then you know, control a drone or a small robot. Um, 
only with obviously the uh, the kind of capabilities that you'd find in an insect um, uh, but still that's that that's uh, that's quite a lot of neurons to control um, some autonomous device and and we've also learned a lot um, in the development and use of spinnaker one about what's important and that's allowed us to tune the design of spinnaker two even more to the problem of of modeling biological neurons in real time uh, than we were able to tune spinnaker one because at that time we didn't know uh, we've had, you know, had 10 years more learning since then um, that we're building into spinnaker two do you see um looking into the future i mean is is obviously um difficult to do um with with anything um and uh, particularly so with the uh, computing industry but um can you see a cross fertilization of uh, ideas with biotech for example i think there, there there's there's quite a lot of um intersection between brain science and biotech uh, obviously I, I mentioned earlier the the issue that, that that the pharmaceutical industries have in developing drugs for diseases of the brain um, that they can't, they can't really make progress and they've largely stopped investing for that reason uh, because the way they develop drugs these days is, is, is they understand the disease pathway, they build models of it and then they design drugs to interfere with the disease pathway. Uh, but with the brain we don't have the models. Um, and, and, and so I hope that, that, that Spinnaker will contribute to the effort that will result in those models becoming available. Now, of course, we're not the only project in that space at all. There are many people working to try and fill that gap. Um, but at the point where we can have even partially representative models that can be used to, uh, to, to see the effects of brain diseases and to model uh, the influence that drugs would have on those, uh, then I think we're in a very strong position for interactions with, with, with the pharma industry. Um, and, and uh, I mean, I guess that's not. Excuse me. What, what about uh, uh, the manufacture and creation of human tissue? Um, is that an area where there could be some crossover way into the future? Well, I, I think that's probably beyond my field of, of, of experience to comment on. I mean, I'm, a, you know, I understand the sort of tissue that makes microchips, and uh, not the sort of tissue that makes people. It makes brains. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I, I, I know the functional yes. uh, issue yeah. that makes brains, but I, I'm, uh, I'm really only interested in its function. I'm not, I'm not really interested in the, in the details of the biology, which, of course, a lot of the, the neuroscientists are very interested in, you know, yeah. each time. They're not interested in uh, creating a human brain, as it were. Well, I think um, creating a human brain is... is, is either in, in, in computing material or in, well, in biological material, we know how to create human brains, but that's probably not what you're referring to. Um, on current technology, if we could, if we knew enough to build a complete model of the human brain, it would occupy an aircraft hangar and require a small power station of its own to run it. Um, so it would in no sense be any kind of real threat to the biological brains as, as a competitor. And, and nor would it be anywhere near anything we could build into a mobile humanoid robot that would look and you know, walk and talk like a human. Um, that's still a very long way off our current technology. And of course, we don't have the knowledge to know how to build such a model anyway. Um, but but um, where I think there will be, uh, there already is some progress and it's going to get more dramatic is, is in brain prostheses. Um, so not, displacing the human brain but, but actually adding it to it and, and where I say that this is already happening of course one clear example is a cochlear implant um, which is a treatment for certain forms of deafness um, and, and, and there's a piece of electronics which basically interfaces directly with nerves that go into the brain and is very effective. Um, on a similar vein um, retinal implants are emerging um, they're not as uh, as fully developed as, as cochlear implants, but but they're certainly going in the right direction um, to enable us to uh, restore sight to people with with certain forms of blindness. I mean, it's not a 
it's, it's not a cure for all forms of blindness, but for certain forms where um, the, the, the problem is in the biological retina, it's becoming increasingly possible to think about replacing the biological retina in the, in the physical eyeball with a, a silicon retina that connects into the optic nerve and restores, um, at the moment, a fairly uh, low resolution form of vision, but that will improve over time. Um, those, those kind of activities are, are, are using the technology to compensate for, uh, for disease or, or, or deficiency. And, and are reasonably uncontroversial, I think. Of course, there's also the question as to whether you could build a, a, an interface that would give you a sort of memory prosthetic, um, because we have very effective and reliable computer memory chips. Um, could you augment your brain's capabilities um, through this sort of technology? I mean, I, 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 that's not an area of, of interest to me. Um, it's clearly an area where the technology is not far away from being able to deliver something. Um, I think there's a lot for the ethicists, sorry, the ethicists, ethicists think about uh, yes. before we go there. Yeah. Um, why is that such a difficult word to say? <laughs> um, and, 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 and so the, a lot of thought needs going into there, but the, the technology is not far off being able to contemplate that kind of, um, brain capability augmenting prosthesis I mean the, um, but again this this isn't an area we're working in um, we, our, our, our work is, is is very much focused on on the science problem of understanding what the basic functionality in the brain looks like and also um, understanding the differences between biological intelligence and, and machine intelligence which has exploded over the last decade in parallel with our work, uh, seeing where the differences and similarities are and where the opportunities for crossover might be. You know, is AI actually, as, as implemented by leading people such as, as Google DeepMind, mm -hmm. is this telling us something about natural intelligence or is it completely different? Um, and, and, and if it is telling us something, are we picking up those lessons? And as we learn more about the brain, can the lessons we learn be transferred into, into that machine intelligence space? What is your opinion about embodied uh, cognition? Oh, I think um, once you're modeling the brain above a certain level, um, it becomes almost meaningless to do it without some form of embodiment. At the level at which we're currently doing it, that's not the case. So you know, currently we have you know, a very detailed biological model of a square millimeter of cortex. Um, and, 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 and that seems to be quite accurate in the sense that it, it reproduces measured firing rates and so on, but it doesn't actually do anything. Um, so it doesn't need an embodiment to, um, to be useful scientifically. Uh, but as soon as you start um, looking at brain subsystems, um, these subsystems always have sensory inputs at one end and, and you know, muscle or actuator outputs at, at the other end. And, and, and they're much more likely to, to behave sensibly and give meaningful results if, they, if they're connected to suitable um, sensors and actuators. Now, of course, they needn't necessarily be physical. Uh, these could be virtual. Because the model is virtual, it could be connected to virtual sensors, which are you know, seeing a scene in a virtual environment and controlling movement in that virtual environment. So, um, so the embodiment of the virtual environment is removing some quite important real world phenomena. Um, and so if you really want to understand how this brain system works in the real world, you, you have to embody it in a physical robot of some sort. Okay, uh, I have to thank Michael Menino, uh, neuroscientist and also uh, neuroscience IDME ambassador for that question before we move on. Okay. <laughs> uh, so thank you, Michael. Um, and thank you for your answer, Steve. Um, I, if we can uh, go back to Spinnaker and uh, to um, the, the, the things that make it special within the context um, of computing and other similar systems. Um, can you talk about the flexibility? 
Yes, uh, I mean this. This really is 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 uh, a metric that um, positions Spinnaker relative to the many other um, uh, neuromorphic systems that have been developed around the world. So, for example, within the Human Brain Project, we um, we collaborate with a team at Heidelberg who are developing the Brain Scale system, which is a very different approach um, with some similar objectives of modeling brain systems. And, and the differences are um, in the fact that we model uh, the behavior of a neuron by implementing the equations that describe that behavior in software on very small processes. Um, they implement those equations by finding analogous electronic circuits uh, that, that where if you describe those circuits in equations, you get the same equations as in the biology. So they talk about their system as a physical model that effectively the functionality is being mapped into uh, an electronic substrate, whereas ours is much more um, uh, a, pro uh, a programmed model. Um, we have software. And, and in between, those are, the, those are really two ends of the, of the neuromorphic scale. And in between, um, there are devices such as the low EHE chip that Intel has developed um, that is not a product. They're not pushing it into the market as a product, what they're doing is, is putting it out as a research prototype and encouraging academic groups to explore its capabilities. I think um, until we can prove that there are commercially viable capabilities from these chips, there's little point in, to, in productizing them. And, and so Intel is exploring that space and, and 10 years earlier, of course, IBM built the True North chip, which is in a similar sort of middle space between um, our software approach and Heidelberg's analog electronic circuit approach. And there are many other groups, uh, for example, from um, ETH in Zurich, um, Stanford in the USA, who are developing chips in, in, in this space. And, and we sit at the, the very soft end, so nearly every aspect of Spinnaker is, is software configurable. So we can construct the routing tables that make the neural network connections in software. Um, we can build the neural models in software. So if a neuroscientist has a new observation that requires an adjustment to the equations, we can implement that fairly easily. Whereas Heidelberg has to redesign their circuit and remanufacture their chips. So, so uh, you know, there are merits in flexibility. There are also costs. Um, the cost of implementing an algorithm in software is, is roughly an order of magnitude um, increased power consumption compared with implementing it in dedicated digital hardware. And, and, and the digital hardware is less efficient than the analog hardware. So, um, so the physical model approach has, has major advantages in, in efficiency. Um, and and um, all, all, of, all of these approaches uh, contribute and, and, and cause people to think about the problems in different ways. And we don't know currently, you know, there is no single right answer at the moment. It's, it, it's a space that's still being explored. Um, and uh, we don't know if, if or when a right answer will emerge that will say, you know, this is the right way and, and uh, all the others are less efficient. Could you tell the audience about the principles of uh, Moore's law? Oh, Moore's law is a principle that, that underpins all chip technology. Um, it's named after Gordon Moore, who was one of the founders of Intel. And in 1965, he published a paper um, where he talked about his observation that the number of transistors that Intel could manufacture on a chip uh, was doubling every, I think, 18 months at that time or two years. Um, and this was, if you like, the, 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 the core of advances in chip technology. And he confidently predicted in 1965 that this would continue for 10 years. So Moore's law was a prediction made in 1965 with a, an end date of 1975. Um, and of course, it didn't end in 75. It went on and on and on. Um, it's now very much approaching its limits. Uh, but doubling every two years is, is an exponential process. And if you double every two years, then uh, two to the 10, every 20 years, you get a thousand times more capability. Every 40 years, a million times more capability. Um, so it's a ferocious rate of growth. And, and from the 
late 70s, it's really been the major planning tool of, of the whole global semiconductor industry. Um, all of their plans have been embodied in, in a vast document called the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors, which is about a thousand pages and tells you what the next 10 or 20 years are going to look like and where the major problems are, and what solutions are emerging. It's, it's a huge planning tool that's, uh, that's, that's underpinned hundreds of billions of dollars in investment um, in driving chip technology from where we were in 1965 to where we are today. Um, you concentrate on one particular area. Where do you see computing going? Do you see it uh, involving uh, a number of different approaches, uh, cold computing, computing, uh, atomic? Um, where, where do you see it going? So uh, computing is, is approaching a threshold. Um, Moore's law has gone on for half a century, but it can't go on much longer. And the reason it can't go on much longer is the major mechanism that's being used to deliver it has been making transistors ever smaller. And they're now getting very close to atomic scale. And you know, clearly the, the size of an atom is a fundamental limit. You can't change that. There've been physical limits at many points in the development of Moore's law and they've all been overcome. So in the 90s, it was generally viewed that, that we would never get past one micron feature size because the, the, the chips are made using a photographic lithography technique. Wavelength of blue light is 390 nanometers. You can't possibly manufacture anything that's less than two or three wavelengths in size. That was obvious in the 90s. We now routinely manufacture things which are a tiny fraction of the wavelength of the light that's used to draw them. And, and, and that was a huge transformation in understanding of what you could do with the lithography. You have to stop thinking about it as a printing plate and start thinking about the lithographic mask as a diffraction grating. And you can do use multiple masks and overlay diffractions to get very, very small features. Um, it's a formidable achievement and it involves solving computational inverse problems and other things. But, um, but we are clearly now getting to a limit. The cost of designing a chip has gone through the roof. The cost of building a factory for today's chips has gone through the roof. Everything's become infeasibly expensive as we approach the physical limits. So everybody is asking, what are the alternatives to, to just driving Moore's law forward? Um, now, one answer to that question has emerged in the last decade in this parallel development or as i described earlier explosion in machine learning systems which are actually based on neural networks but they're not biologically realistic neural networks they're an earlier form of a continuous net that doesn't spike um, but they've taken over machine learning in a, in a very dramatic way uh, and, and they've shifted the center of gravity in, of, of computing uh, quite a lot um, from um, the, the sort of standard paradigm of, 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 of high precision deterministic computation where if you run the same program twice, you expect identical answers into this world of, 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 of more neural operations where things are a bit random, a bit unpredictable, where the calculations don't really need to be that accurate most of the time. And, and that's creating an opportunity for people to come up with some really exciting new architectures to support machine learning. Because you can do the training and inference on conventional machines, but it is very expensive. And, and so really only the very big companies can afford to do this as part of their mainstream business because they have the data centers full of expensive compute to run this on. So there are many companies emerging that are trying to, if you like, democratize machine learning by introducing chip technology that makes it much cheaper to, to do. Um, that's a relatively modest change, but it, 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 is, it is quite significant economically. Um, alongside this, people are talking about the potential role that, that even more brain-like technology, neuromorphic technology, such as Spinnaker, might play in the future of computing. They see that as 
as having the potential, though it's not yet proven, uh, to take machine learning to another level to solve some of the problems that they currently can't solve. It's clear, you know, biological systems learn continuously, whereas machine learning is done by having a hugely expensive training process and then a, a cheaper inference process. Um, but once you're in the inference phase, you stop learning. You're just using what you've already learned. Um, biological systems keep learning, and, and, and that's attractive. Um, also, uh, a thing I frequently quote is you know, the famous Google uh, image classification network had to be shown 10 million pictures of cats, after which it was very good at recognizing cats, whereas my two-year-old grandson, when he'd seen one cat, could recognize cats reliably for the rest of his life. And, 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 and so there's something different now. It's not a fair comparison because the Google network starts off with its brain completely scrambled, whereas the two-year-old has had two years to develop quite a complex model of the world in his head into which cats fit rather nicely. Um, but it does say there's something different going on and, 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 and maybe we can find systems that don't need huge amounts of data. I mean, what, one of the things that's made deep learning effective is being big data. Um, but biological systems don't seem to need big data. So, so maybe we can get back to small data and build effective learning systems. But these are not solved problems. Even more radical, of course, has been the development in quantum computing. Um, whether that's going to be anything more than a, a sort of an expensive accelerator for very special problems is unclear. Um, there's been a lot of work on what you could do if you could make a quantum computer in, in some ways disproportionate to the amount of work that's been going into actually working out how to make one. Um, Though they are beginning to emerge. I mean, there are quantum machines available, but they're not particularly spectacular in terms of what they can offer. Um, so I'm, I'm a bit of a quantum skeptic, I have to admit. Um, but that's partly because I don't see them delivering within my career horizon, which is uh, you know, rapidly approaching. Um, but but uh, in the longer run, they may have something interesting to offer. Um, your, work, your work has been funded by the uh, Human Brain Project. Um, what impact does or could Brexit have on your well, work overall? The dreaded Brexit question. Well, firstly, <laughs> just to correct you, the, the original development of Spinnaker um, that, that put us in a position to join the HBP, uh, Physical Sciences Research Council, EPSRC, so I have to yeah. acknowledge that without their funding we wouldn't be in HBP. Uh, HBP is now the major source of funding but the, the machines were funded by EPSRC and HBP is... Was that funded. prior to the this these last 10 years? Well HBP has been running six years now. Oh, okay. It started in 2013. All right. We had all the silicon design and, and, and chips made um, in 2011. Um, we were building boards so we've continued scaling up the machine and only last year did we get to our original target of a million processors in the machine. Yes, um, yes. And, and, but, but technically that's, that wasn't that significant uh, an achievement because we'd had half a million online for, for two and a half years and people were still working out what to do with that. So. Uh, it was a it was a celebration because it was the original goal. So yeah. so for the last six yeah. years we we we've, we've had our software team supported by the Human Brain Project and the development of Spinnaker Two. Mm -hmm. um, the the um, the reassurance we have um, on the Brexit matter is that any EU science program contracts which are entered into by the end of 2020 will be underwritten by the UK government whatever the outcome of the Brexit negotiations um, and, 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 and therefore that will actually cover the remaining three years of HBP. So I don't think our, our HBP funding is under any threat from Brexit, although it creates a, a huge atmosphere of uncertainty and of course it, it creates yeah. doubts in the minds of our partners and the European Commission. Um, but I think our ability to continue to participate is not um, threatened by the funding position. Okay. Um, we spoke earlier about um, what makes the uh, Spinnaker system um, special. 
um, uh, connectedness, the way in which uh, the individual components connect, uh, you've described as the uh, special thing. Um, if I can take you uh, into uh, a new area, which is your human story, and um, ask you um, whether there were any uh, special uh, rich connections with individuals uh, in your past that helped you to uh, move forward with your life, move forward with your innovations. So uh, obviously there have been a, a number of important people in my life, but I guess, I guess uh, sort of um, passing over family, which is always important, I think, um, and, and, uh, and, 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 and school teachers. Um, I, I did my PhD under the su supervision of Sean Fax Williams at Cambridge, who was a very interesting PhD supervisor. Um, he was somebody who everything he did he did with great enthusiasm and it didn't matter whether it was the technical work you were talking about in the phd supervision or whether it was playing bowls on the emmanuel fellows lawn after lunch um it, it, he he somehow managed to find sort of excessive enthusiasm in all of these contexts which which was uh, was quite infectious but i think probably the person who's had the biggest influence comes after that, and that was Herman Hauser, who was the founder of Acorn, um, who, who, who had a, a, an approach to sort of creative engineering that, that I think um, inspired everybody in Acorn in the early years and, and uh, sort of underpinned the development of the BBC Micro and the ARM processor. Um, in, in that um, uh, he was always you know, very close to the technical team. He didn't technically lead the technical team. He was, uh, he was a sort of a managing director of the company. Um, but, but he was always around when there were interesting challenges to be faced. Um, and, and of course it was his fault that I moved from aerodynamics into computing. Um, in aerodynamics where I had you know experience and qualifications into computing where I had none of the above um, and, and, and he, he recruited um, myself and, and, and Sophie Wilson from the Cambridge University processor group which was just a society of people who built computers for fun and, 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 and formed the company Acorn around us um, so I think he, he was probably a big influence and certainly um, my acorn years set the direction for the rest of my career. Um, you, you were obviously um, a shining star at uh, university and, and uh, acorn. Um, it would be interesting to hear uh, from, a, from an academic uh, perspective, uh, but um, what element or how important is um, that, I mean, we're talking about neurons and spiking. Um, how, um, how important was that uh, emotional spark with those two individuals that you mentioned, that emotional spike? Um, or was it just purely intellectual? They saw that you were um, possibly head and shoulders above everybody else um, at your time. Uh, or was it a combination of the two things? It's well, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't agree with the description of, of, of <laughs> the head of shoulders above our colleagues. I think um, yes. you know, Herman, Herman was, was very good at finding people and I think, uh, the team that we worked with across ACORN um, uh, was all very capable and, and very committed and very effective at working together. Um, I mean, in the case of myself and Sophie, there was a kind of a creative tension. I mean, the relationship was not always smooth. We often disagreed. Um, and and uh, you know, I, I, I sort of had the sort of more practical and more human skills and Sophie was, was extremely good. I mean, it has a sort of memory that uh, remembers every detail of everything. It's quite terrifying to work with people like that. Um, and, 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 um, and, and so we wouldn't, uh, you know, it, 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 it wasn't a smooth and gentle ride. It was quite 
it, there was quite a lot of creative tension. And, and several of the other people that, that um, we worked with, I mean, these were people who went on to lead on when it became a company and grew it to its you know, global influence today. People like uh, Tudor Brown and, 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 and Mike Muller. Um, you know, I, uh, Mike was also a great source of creative tension. He was, he was Acorn's antidote to groupthink. Whatever, whatever everybody else in the room was agreeing on, he would disagree on. Oh. <laughs> and, and, and this is actually very useful. It's dangerous to have a room full of people that all agree. Um, so, um, so there were a lot of very good people. I mean, Sophie and I happened to uh, be in at the start. Chris Turner was also a chief engineer early on and a major contributor um, to the BBC Micro success story. And there were, there were many others. I mean, I think um, what, what, one of my views on, on sort of on human heroes is, is they're nearly always inappropriately badged as such, because <laughs> if you take any individual out of the picture, you find it doesn't really change much. You know, if Einstein hadn't done general relativity, I think some other guy was six months behind him. Um, so, um, you, you, most human progress, I think, is cultural rather than individual. Um, and, and you need the right sort of people in the right place and then, then the ideas emerge. Um, I'd like to ask you whether you are currently mentoring anybody, connecting with maybe someone, a, a, a younger generation um, who through having that connection with you is moving their story forward and in turn potentially the entire human story forward. Um, you said that culture is, is a key component, but one-to-one um, uh, -one mentoring and connecting that way, whether it is um, in an official capacity or informal capacity, is um, is very powerful. Um, well, uh, I have a number of roles which are officially described as, as mentoring. Um, I, I'm, I'm a professor. <laughs> I, I'm a professor, so I have PhD students yes. that I yeah. uh, that, that I supervise, which is a sort of blend of mentoring and encouraging and cajoling and. Um, all, all those other things. I think that, that that's probably the most direct mentoring that I do. But I'm also I'm a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, and and um, I've mentored quite a number of uh, of Royal Academy of Engineering research fellows over the years. Um, some of whom have gone on to great things. Um, Are that, you allowed to mention any names? Well, um, uh, Mayer O'Neill at, at, at Queen's University Belfast was my first Royal Academy mentor, and I think she she went on to become you know, the youngest professor of electrical engineering at, at Queen's and so on, and, and uh, uh, has won a number of awards in engineering. Her subject area is quite different from mine. She, she implements um, hardware in, in the area of cryptography and computer security. Um, but um, whether you know her star has risen as a result of or in spite of my mentoring, it's hard to say. Um, it, it, I, I very much doubt it's you know, that, that my mentoring was a was a major factor in this. I think it was going to happen anyway. Um, and, and and so I've I've mentored four or five people um, that way. Um, as I say, PhD students are probably the most direct because an academy mentor really it, it's a sort of annual meeting with occasional contact in between. It's not a, it's not a very close um, mentoring role. Uh, with PhD students, um, uh, you have much more involvement with them. But I I, I find that, that 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 works best for me because I have a, a fairly a substantial research group of about twenty people, and 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 so. Um, it's not the traditional, you know, single student with single supervisor struggling away in a dark room with a, with a pad of paper and a pencil trying to solve a hard problem. Um, most of the time we're building things and, and, and the students are getting as much, if not more, support from 
the rest of the team uh, than they're receiving directly from me. And, and, and my role in this is to, uh, well, primarily bring in the funds so I can pay the bills, um, but secondly, to keep the team sort of working reasonably smoothly and pointing in the right direction, which creates a context in which PhD students can flourish. Um, your work, your team's work, has attracted uh, an enormous amount of uh, world attention. So you have the opportunity to meet uh, the great and the good. Um, out of everybody that you could meet, who would you like to meet and what question would you like to ask them? I was, I was given advance warning of this question. I'm still not entirely sure how to answer it. You, you've now posed it as though it, it's uh, the individual has to be work related. No, uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. <laughs> so, I mean, I, 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 there aren't any individuals that I'm particularly desperate to meet. Um, but somebody who's been a kind of hero in a different space of mind since an early age is Justin Haywood, who's the uh, lead guitar. Uh, a guitarist and singer with the Moody Blues um, and, 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 and whose music has accompanied me through my life since, uh, since my mid-teens. Um, I, I particularly admire his, uh, his sense of sort of harmony and, and, and controlled emotion. Um, uh, so he's somebody I've, I've seen him perform several times but uh, I've never met him personally and I think I'd uh, if I had a chance to talk to him, I'd like to sort of understand where the, uh, the ideas for his songs come from. Steve Ferber, thank you very much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Thank you very much.